Okay, I think that this is a good time to start. Um, we've got all of the readers here. Um, we have a lot of people in the audience who have arrived. So uh, welcome to Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California. Um, this reading is co-sponsored by Poets House and Scarlet Tanager Books um, as a program in their Literary Partners Program. And I want to thank everybody very much for joining us today. Um, before people start reading, um, please make sure that your microphone is off. Um, only the readers should have their, their, microphones, uh, their microphones on. And also, um, we'll have a break halfway through the event, and we'll also have a discussion at the end, so please wait to use the chat until then. Uh, my name is Lucille Lang Day, and I am the publisher of Scarlet Tanager Books, hey. and I'm also the co-editor of this anthology, Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California. Um, my co-editor is Ruth Nolan, and Ruth and our and six of our contributors will also be reading this afternoon. Um, I've put in the, at the top of the chat, I've put um, links uh, for, uh, to the Scarlet Tanager books and the anthology and my own website and everybody reading should put their websites into the chat if you haven't done so already. Um, Ruth and I are giving all of the profits from Fire and Rain from sales to uh, seven environmental organizations, and all of the contributors have, have donated their work to this anthology, too. Uh, the program today was uh, originally supposed to be a live event at Poets House in New York, a reading and reception in April, and then the coronavirus hit, and we had to turn it um, we, we had to reschedule it, and we optimistically rescheduled it for a live event in New York uh, at Poets House on October 10th. But then, obviously, it's still not safe to travel. Uh, it's not safe to attend a live reading. And so, uh, so we have turned it into the, this Zoom event, and we're, we're very happy that, that we could go forward th with this because the subject is so important, we didn't want to postpone this reading again. Um, as uh, all of you know from the news, California is having its worst fire season ever. Um, I trained as a biologist before I became a poet, so biology has always been uh, very important to my poetry. And Fire and Rain uh, is an anthology about California ecosystems. Uh, it's divided into eight sections uh, corresponding to major uh, bioregions of California. For example, um, there's a coast and ocean section, a desert section, a coastal redwood section, and, um, and uh, five other sections. And as it turns out, um, fire is a, a, is a good and normal part of California ecology under normal circumstances. There were wildfires in California long before there were people here. Um, and the cones of some of the conifers here won't open and release their seeds unless there's a fire. Um, and on top of that, uh, some of the species have evolved um, to thrive uh, during fires. Um, now, however, things have gotten totally out of control. And there are a number of reasons for that. One is climate change. Um, California has the hottest temperatures ever. Uh, and we also have droughts that last for multiple years. And with everything very hot and dry, things catch fire very easily and then um, and, and these fires spread and they're very hard to contain. 
We've also had population growth with more people living in the wild fire prone areas. Um, and so, and that has contributed to the loss of buildings and loss of lives. And finally, we have, a, we have reckless power companies in California, um, PG&E, um, a specific gas and electric company as of 2017, the average age of their transmission towers was 68 years old. And many, many of the towers were more than 100 years old. And the lines weren't properly insulated. So the old, a piece breaks off the old tower or the old tower falls over. Um, and the next thing that, that you know, there, it can, there's a fire that's hard to contain. Yeah, and I, I'd like to add in real quick, Lucy, um, as a former wildland firefighter, and I'm currently a researcher into fire ecologies and communities and um, firefighting suppression in California, another really big problem this year, which has been not very well expressed, is the um, California's heavy reliance on our inmate populations for inmate fire crews, typically getting paid a dollar a day. And when I was a firefighter, I worked alongside a lot of the inmates. There's men and women from multiple crews, and apparently more than 50% of the pandemic, I'm sorry, 50% of the inmate crews were sidelined, quarantined in their fire camps due to the coronavirus. So um, this isn't entirely tying in with the ecologies of California, also a social justice, social, environmental, ecologic issue that I'm also working to highlight, because um, clearly this is not a good plan and not sufficient, just like that aging um, infrastructure on the PG&E and other utility companies in California, the reliance on the inmate crews, basically at very unfair wages. Um, this needs to be restructured. So I just wanted to throw that in there that just like yeah, for well, our reason, the you. pandemic has really affected how we're doing this. The pandemic has also had a really influential role in what's happening in our ecologies in California right now with the fires. Yeah, yeah, thank you for making those points. And one more point about the infrastructure is just as a minimal thing that the PG&E should have um, modern transmission towers and insulated power lines. Oh, but, but ideally, all of the, in the wild areas, all of these pot power lines and t should be underground. They shouldn't be up where the trees are and where they can start fires. So anyhow, that there's so they so we have major problems of ecology in California, um, and really the time to do something is now because and it's not just California; it's worldwide that we have um, global warming and we have multiple ecological um, problems, and there are solutions, and it's it really takes all of us to work on those solutions so that we can not only save California, but save the whole planet Earth. Because um, as far as I know, there's no planet B. So uh, now I, I want to read a couple of poems from, from Fire and Rain, uh, poems of, that are literally about fire and rain um, are distributed through the whole book because fire and rain impact all California ecosystems. So the first one I'll read is a fire poem. It's called Red and it's by Toby Hiller. At first, it looks like weather, great plumes and fluffs of cumulus. No, white smoke, bellies wide behind Mount Shasta, red haze bleeds up over Mount Eddy and the marbles spreads. It is a Turner sky scorched into dreamy rows. Below, inferno, char, flake, ash, blacken the hoods of cars. Sky billows thick, blushes and falls. On roof, tree, bush, shoulder, barn, all that waits and runs and stands here below. Beyond the ridges, air baked into smudge and glue, Animals run, brush darkens in the crimson, shimmers, trembles into cinder. Roar of fire, tornadoes up the canyons, world cauldron, 
Um, pines explode, nitrogen flies free. The West Coast's on fire, North and South, and we are tender, prophesied in this red future's unhoped, and shall we call it healing breath? And the, um, in, when things work the way we hope they will, um, fire, rain comes after the fire, so I'm going to read a, a rain poem next. Um, it's called Gwalala Winter, and it's by Kathleen McClung, and this poem is a sonnet. Keep dreaming of gray deer asleep in woods as sheets of rain claim every living thing. Tailor bees, bracelet cones, chipmunks, hawk broods high up in nests that sway but last. Each wing, leaf, stem of fern soaked through, wet to the core, endures these January storms we track, evade behind our screens, our twice locked doors. Nervous, we curse old roofs, new leaks, come back, mend quietly what's torn, listen to wind, confuse it with Pacific coast close by. Cars crossing flooded roads, gray deer may find, logs hollowed out, may it may curl inside stay mostly dry under moss bark or not our sun will rise night storms will end we animals open our eyes and next um my husband uh, richard michael levine who has a poem in the anthology will read his poem uh richard uh, ha, is an author with, he has a book of poems out, a book of short stories, as well as a best-selling nonfiction book. Um, he's a journalist, um, as well as a creative writer and has published many articles in major magazines. So Richard, you're on. This is a, a villanelle I'll be reading from my collection, uh, Catch and Other Poems. and. Uh, this is a villanelle, or as my exacting wife tells me, almost a villanelle. Turning 70 at a and b on Clear Lake. Suppose for a moment I hadn't turned 70 that day, and the jagged hills didn't monitor my heart, nor the grebes on the lake float their separate ways. Lost friends and lovers flitted through my mind, like the yellow-bellied warblers in the sedge. Suppose for a moment I hadn't turned 70 that day. I was reading a book about Caravaggio, short-lived sinner saint of light and shadow, as the grebes on the lake fluttered their separate ways. Then two of the birds paired off their fluid necks and pressed breasts, forming a heart that soothed my own. Suppose for a moment I hadn't turned 70 that day. My wife and I held hands and stared in wonder as the mate stove down for some grass to offer each other while the rest of the grebes floated their separate ways. They rose to their feet and skied off together so fast and so far they left a wake of winking water. Suppose for a moment I hadn't turned 70 that day and seen the grebes on the lake dance away. Thank you, and when we're muted, we can, uh, we can wave our hands to express our appreciation of the poems. So um, I uh, will conclude with, a, with two of my own poems from the anthology. Uh, the first one is called Naturalists. It's for my grandson, Devin, Devlin. And it appears in the cities, towns, and roads section of the book. Two years old, he takes my hand, leads me to the blackberry vine growing on the fence in his backyard. They're not ripe yet, he explains, then points to a small hole in the earth. The ants live there. I need a digging stick, he announces, holding up a fragile twig and shaking his head. This one's no good. I hand him a thicker stick, perfect.
perfect. In a shady corner near the patio, he digs and makes a find. It's a roly-poly in a ball, he says. I hold out my hand to receive the woodlouse, a terrestrial crustacean. Gretchen and I called them pill bugs in first grade when we found them with ants and Jerusalem crickets. Careful, my grandson warns. A pincher bug, it will pinch you. He points to an earwig, an insect with cerci, forceps on its abdomen. It's had five molts before becoming an adult. Someday I will tell him this and that females have straight pinchers, males curved ones. Today though, he's the teacher and I'm his eager pupil standing in light while blackberries ripen and a woodlouse unrolls. And my next poem is called Muir Woods at Night, and it is in the coastal redwood section of the book. Rust-colored ladybugs, clustered like grapes, made on horse tails that wave by a creek, where silvery salmon spawn and leap when the sandbar breaks at the gate to the sea. The ladybugs have come hundreds of miles from valley to coast for this single's bash. The females are choosy. They twiddle the males, seeking appendages padded with fat. And all around, high in redwood burls, on elk clover leaves and in the rich soil, the meaning of life is to stroke and prod under a humpbacked moon dissolving in fog. So um, what is going to happen next um, is that we're going to have four contributors read. That will take about a half hour. Um, and then we'll take a five minute break. And then we'll come back and Ruth will read, my co-editor, with uh, two more contributors. That will take about another half hour. And then the rest of the time will be devoted to um, discussion and questions with the audience. So um, our next reader is Anne Whitehouse. Uh, Anne's most recent poetry collection is Outside from the Inside, which just came out from Dos Madres Press. Sur Surrealist Muse, her long poem about the artist Leonora Carrington is forthcoming, as is The Imp of the Perverse, the third in a series of essays about Edgar Allan Poe. So let's welcome Anne. Thank you so much. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Welcome, Anne. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Lucy, for inviting me. I'm happy to be here. Um, my poem I'm going to read from the anthology following Lucy's is also about the Muir Woods. It's from my collection, Blessings and Curses, and it's a blessing. The poems are numbered, and um, this one is Blessing 24. The redwood trees stand like sentinels on the lonely coast, the tips of their lofty spires lost in fog, shaggy trunks and fragrant needles dripping in the rain that swells Redwood Creek as it tumbles from Mount Tamil Pass to the sea. Saving these woods from ax and saw, from money changers and water changers, is the most notable service to God and man I've heard of since my forest wanderings began, wrote John Muir in gratitude to William Kent, after Kent bought the land to preserve it in Muir's name with his blessing. If we lost all the money we have and saved these trees, it would be worthwhile, vowed Kent to his wife. Such a racket echoed through Muir Woods the day we saw that one salmon struggling upstream, flapping half out of water. The sound of it drowned out everything else. All our lives we'd heard of its grueling uphill journey at the end of life, yet until that day we'd never seen one fighting the swift shallow cur current, striking through the surface in great blows. We waited on the bridge and watched it go out of sight up the rocky bottomed creek. 
My next poem is also a California poem. It's called Scenes from California, and it's from my poetry collection, Meteor Shower. One. Oh, it's divided in three parts. The first part and the last part are about Point Reyes National Seashore, and the second part is about the countryside around Ukiah. One. Elk in fog. To think that diaphanous fog could obscure so massive a creature silhouetted against the horizon as if far away, while the ocean, veiled in mists, roared against the cliffs. Two, trapped cow. Somehow it slipped down the muddy gully and couldn't climb out. A man out hiking heard the bellowing and summoned the farmer who shot the animal out of mercy. Surprisingly preserved, its body leans against the incline like a black shadow, its unseen feet resting in shallow water. Three, life landforms. The slopes of the headlines of the headlands slide smoothly to the sea of cold waters and roiling tides. Under a wet shock of brown grass, the narrow skeleton of a fox, where weeds blow back yellow and russet and coots align in even rows across the rippling surface of a pond. Past mossy trees tangled in vines and lichen-covered fences of an old farm lies a ribbon of brown sand without beginning or end. So we contributors all decided that we would read a poem by someone else in the anthology, not our own. And because of the fires, I decided to read um, a poem I really admire, Seeds of the Giant Sequoia by Rebecca Faust. Mm. Seeds of the giant sequoia come cone born, encased in diamond hard coats. Something secreted encrypts them against climate and time, lets them wait out the cold ground generations of winters for that lightning crack, thunderbolt, trunk, split of fire to fissure them to life. Dull glitter of years layering down. But when the firestorm comes, the ground melts and boils like stew, swells each seed from germ to cohen seeks meaning from rain, memory from pain, how it feels to feel anything. Thank you, Rebecca, for such a beautiful poem. And then the last poem I'm going to read is not about California, but it's about two Californians, Coco the Gorilla and Robin Williams. And it's called Coco and Robin. When Coco met Robin Williams, she was in mourning for Michael, a fellow gorilla and her lifelong friend. They'd grown up together like brother and sister. The smile she gave Robin was her first in six months. Coco recognized Robin from the television shows where he'd impersonated Mork, an alien befriended by Mindy who helped him to adjust to life on Earth. While off camera, he chased her copying a feel. Mindy recalled, I was flashed, humped, bumped, grabbed. He'd look at me real playful, like a puppy with those sparkly eyes, and then he'd do it and run off, and he could get away with it. In sign language, Coco asked Robin to tickle her, and she tickled him back, laughing, baring her teeth in joy. She played with him, putting on his glasses, picking his pockets. She could have crushed him, but she cradled him in her strong, hairy arms, rocked him gently to and fro. He felt himself relax, inhaling her smell, matching his breathing to hers. She stroked his arms, hairy for a human, and stared into his eyes, and he stared into hers. Later, in interviews on talk shows and in stand-up routines, Coco was Robin's comic fodder. He mocked her lasciviousness as he construed it. Yet, there was more. 
we shared something extraordinary, awesome, and unforgettable. Robin was Coco's playmate, friend for a day, a creature she had held in her arms and rocked like one of her kittens. Mm. Consumed by illness and sadness years later, Robin took his own life. Learning of his death, Coco wept. Mm. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Thank you so much. That poem's from my recent collection, <laughs> Outside from the Inside. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, too. <laughs> Okay, so um, our next reader will be Sally Bleamus Dunn, who teaches modern poetry at Manhattanville College and the Palm Beach Poetry Festival. Uh, her third collection, Echolocation, was published by, Blue, by Plume Editions Mad Hat Press in 2018. Uh, Echolocation was long listed for the Julie Suck Award and was a finalist for the Eric Hoffer Award in 2002. Uh, she was a finalist for the Pablo Neruda, Pro oh, it, I'm sorry, in 2002 what happened was she was a finalist for the Pablo Neruda Prize. So Sally. I just realized I hadn't unmuted myself. Thank you so much, Lucy and Ruth, for putting together this incredible anthology and for including me in it and for organizing this. Um, I know from all the emails that have flurried over the transom that took a lot of work and a lot of love. So really appreciate it. I'm going to start with a poem um, from the anthology that is not my own. It's by Maureen Epstein, and it's from the Coastal Redwood section and it is called Redwood Grove After Fire. Crunch of black fragments underfoot, faint whiff of char, earth beside the trail, fresh broken where a burned tree fell as they sometimes do years later. Cave walls of the hollow giants gleam with fresh scorch. Ferns have returned to the flat, though sparser now. More logs among them fallen. We celebrate survival. Redwood sorrel has spread its green salve over ashy ground. Warty and wrinkled, the old ones stand in their accustomed silence. Love that poem. Mm -hmm. Um, the next poem I'd like to read is from the anthology, um, and it is my own. It's called Sea Lions, and it's from, um, I went to the Galapagos about eight years ago, and I have a little chapbook um, that has a, a poem about, each poem is about a different animal, and this is Sea Lions. It's from, it's from the coast and ocean section. Sea Lions. And, and when we were watching these, it's true what you've heard. The animals are simply not afraid of you. And I mean, what I'm about to describe was maybe 20 feet away. It's almost incredible to remember. Sea lions. Amid the heap of them, two sea lions, bull's penis, oddly gray, pokes between her hind fins at the soft and fatty split full as the side of a peach where the cleft divides. I imagine pleasure swimming through her body as though through a sea, our mammalian link strong in the briny stench. After, as though their weight relaxed and softened, their bodies widen on the sand. Um. So I'm going to read, I realized that the rest of the poems I'm going to read could all be in the coast and ocean section. <laughs> um, I'm going to read the title poem from Echolocation. Echolocation. The whales can't hear each other calling in the noise cluttered sea. They beach themselves. I saw one once heaved onto the sand with kelp stuck to its blue gray skin. Heavy and immobile, it lay like a great sadness, 
and it was hard to breathe with all the stink. Its elliptical black eyes had stilled, were mostly dry, and barnacles clustered on its back like tiny brown volcanoes. Imagining the other whales, their roving weight, their blue-black webbing of the deep, I stopped knowing how to measure my own grief. And this one, large and dead on the sand, with its unimaginable 500-pound heart. Um, this next one is also from the Galapagos poems, but it made its way into echolocation. It's about frigate birds. It's called Startled. Massive and black, the frigate birds on brambles in the distance, their bright red guller sacks full as spinnaker sails billow from their feathers like giant hearts of skin and air. They remind us of our own hearts, oversized and awkward, quivering in lightest wind. This one's called Quahog, and for those of you who don't know, I didn't until a couple of years ago, it's basically a type of clam. Quahog. Along the shore, like white eyelids, bleached dead clams. I see one that is alive. I stop and watch it open. The two locked lids of its dull shell let emerge a delicate foot, like a white peony petal, that lifts the grains of sand, burying itself until what is left is a pucker on the tidal flats pulsing. The sand is freckled with many such holes, and I feel let in on a secret, as when I caught the scraps of your voice, and I knocked and you showed me the letter from your father who left when you were five, and you told me that you read it sometimes aloud, its white rectangle, a door you keep open like a clam's thin siphon. And I'll read just one more, um, and it's called Work. Work. I could tell they were father and son. The air between them slack as though they hardly noticed one another. The father sanded the gunnels. The boy coiled the lines. And I admired them there, each to his task in the quiet of the long familiar. The sawdust coated the father's arms like dusk coats grass in a field. The boy worked next on the oarlocks, polishing the brass until it gleamed as though he could harness the sun. Who cares what they were thinking? Lucky in their lives, that the spin of the genetic wheel slowed twice to a stop and landed each of them here. Thanks so much. And um, I can't wait to hear everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Wonderful. Um, our next reader will be Patricia Brody. Uh, her poetry books are Dangerous to Know and American Desire. And she teaches a women's poetry and memoir workshop at Barnard. And Patricia worked hard with me last year to set up New York readings for Fire and Rain. And we managed to schedule two in-person events, but then COVID-19 hit and everything changed. We're thrilled, of course, that the Poets House event could go on um, today and become a, a virtual event. Um, but I also want to add that Patricia really spearheaded getting a New York reading for us and getting more than one New York reading for us. Um, she made all of the initial contacts with the venues and then um, I just stepped in to follow up once she found people who were interested. Um, her daughter, Katrina Castro will be reading with her today 
Ruth and I actually accepted one of Katrina's poems, which she'll be reading for the anthology. Um, and then we weren't able to get in touch with her to have her sign the permission form. And so it did, the poem didn't make it into the book. And at that time, we didn't know that she was Patricia's daughter. Um, but we've since found out that she is Patricia's daughter, um, and we're just really happy that she can be here to, to read that poem today. So, Patricia. Okay, unmuted. Yeah. She's also my tech enabler. Um, I've done very little on Zoom without her help, and she's a tech enabler, but I, I am getting better at this, I hope. Um, I'm so, so excited to be here. I, I am going to shout out, I sent this link, Lucy, all over the world. And I do see some of my dear friends from places, as far as I know, from Vienna, Austria, and my dear friends from, also from California, Nevada, high school. And so I'm very excited um, that this, this event is happening in spite of COVID and other tragedy. So I'm grateful to be here today with Lucy and Ruth and many of the East Coast contributors to this wonderful anthology. Um, there's a whole bunch of us. We're actually not in New York. Just think we would all be in a room in New York together at Poets House and now we're all over the world. And so more people can be here than would have been if it was in person. And uh, we are on Rhode Island for a few more days. We've been here for months. And uh, I, I wanted to say that the fires, there's been a big drought here. And the fires at some point in September from California blew across the continent, the, the smoke, and appeared in New England skies. So if anybody, with us today is near or knows about this. It was astounding. We couldn't believe it was the fires. We thought it was some odd weather condition here. Sky turned a strange color. The sun appeared pink from like behind a smoke screen. And then we learned it was California coming all the way to the Atlantic coast. So this is really a bi-coastal call for help and attention. Uh, I looked up last night, uh, it looks like we clearly, we all together here today share this love for the great Golden State, which is the official nickname, if you didn't know. Um, uh, according to some Google source, California's explosive growth following the discovery of gold in 1848, the fields of golden poppies that appear each spring, the Golden Gate Bridge, and the clear golden coastal sunsets, if they were, over the Pacific gave California its nickname. I first met Lucia Langday several years ago when Lucy published a group of poems and photographs of mine for Le Vieux Littéraire, um, an international journal. That issue was called Words and Declarations of War, the unannounced death of language. And I wanted to say, um, instead of my publications, that I'm most proud today of my involvement with Lucy Day's and Ruth Nolan's anthology and any project that Lucy spearheads. She just does fantastic things and I, I'm so happy to know her. Fire and Rain Eco Poetry of California is full of, after all, language, which is what we writers have to call for attention and make change. Last summer, 2019, Lucy and I, as Lucy has mentioned, bi-coastally, we really did toil, sweat, and suffered countless rejections from venues all over New York City, this is before crisis, before COVID, to find an East Coast launch for Fire and Rain. And we never imagined the approaching apocalypse, COVID-19, and California in flames. So for, for us, today's triumphant reading of poems for our earth is the result partly, of course, of that collaboration, which we founded in hope. Now I'd like to introduce uh, 
very lovely new physician poet, Dr. Katrina Castro, who is a first year psychiatry resident at NYU Bellevue Hospital. And although a native New Yorker, her California bio includes yoga teacher certification in Santa Monica, milking goats as a farmhand in Pope Valley and camping near Mendocino, which is the title of the poem she'll read now. Thank you, Mother Patricia. And I just wanna say this poem was literally written by Campfire Light near Mendocino, camping near Mendocino. Check out of Roadway Inn, look up at Redwood Limbs, drive down Compt Ukia Road, still got the tent to unload, last free campsite in Russian Gulch, under the Panhorst Bridge where preteens skip rocks on foggy beach. I scrub my shins with Dr. Bronner's doomed by poison oak. My feet are soaked, but our water filter flipped its lid, so we crunch dry noodles instead and throw our floss into the fire. You gotta listen to the McGarrigal sisters when you get there, my mother told me. Talk to me of Mendocino, but when I close my eyes, I hear a man outside our tent scolding his dog who found Trader Joe's fig bites, we didn't lock in the bear box. And now back to my mother, who first talked to me of Mendocino. Thank you, Katrina. That was great. Oh, okay. Thank you, Katrina. Thank you, Katrina. Um, I lived in the Bay Area in the 70s after Woodstock and before Silicon Valley, where I commuted daily to the peninsula, not sure it's still called that, to work at Guitar Player Magazine, where I wrote the first woman on the cover story, blues folk singer and slide guitar player Bonnie Raitt. The Grateful Dead were still doing free concerts in Golden Gate Park, and we got our medical care at the Hate Free Clinic. The poem I'm reading from the anthology is about a return trip 20 years later to a beloved funky beach over the Golden Gate Bridge through the rainbow painted tunnel. Dimeter shops local. There's an epigraph. We are stardust, we are golden, we are billion year old carbon, and we got to get ourselves back to the garden, Woodstock, Crosby, Stills, and Nash. Demeter shops local. I know that place curving into Stinson. We slid down the damp dune. Oh yeah, I was there, young as no summer. The fog rolls over, bringing brrrr, chill wind instead. My boyfriend from Vienna sent for his smelly sheepskin. I had nothing warm enough for North Blast summer. Later, later, summer again. My daughter, too. And I don't know if I did. So it's all. So sorry. My daughter, too, and I pick red blackberries along the Brambley Road to town. Our rented house, as you describe, eucalyptus squeaky gate askew. Sharp Pacific gust sneaking through. At a hippie thrift shop, I buy her a baby hippie jumpsuit, ripe purple as the fruit in her pail. No other partner needed, we two dressed alike. Um, that was actually a sonnet, and I think it was, was it the coastal section? I think. Um, so no, to I close. Think it's, it's in the cities, towns, and roads yeah. section. Okay, and that city town was Stinson Beach, the town of Stinson Beach. To close, I will read this poem, which Lucy chose for me, since I'm away from my home and my books. I, I couldn't 
look in the anthology. I'm going to order more copies for everybody today. Um, here's a poet I'd like to learn more about with her themes of parent-child and examining the exotic flora of, California, of, of a coast to which she is a visitor. It's by Elizabeth Stossel and it's called uh, Ice Plant Pacific Grove. The infant squints into the California sun in this, his first outdoor photo. The Pacific placid behind them, mother and child are surrounded by a sea of succulent lushness flowering in the sand. The mother, native to Northeast snowplow climes, is astonished by February purples, pinks, and yellows. For years, each time she returns to this coast, she is newly enchanted by the sight of ice plant rampant along the roadsides. Why not try to grow it at home? Then she learns this exotic bloom is not benign. It dominates and conquers native plantings. Both shelter and delicacy to black rats, its thick, unchecked undergrowth is a perfect fuel for wildfires, a demolisher of hillsides. Sad at her discovery and disillusioned by the spitefulness of nature, she is still gladdened by the sight of these flowers. I'm going to read the sad at her discovery and disillusioned by the spitefulness of nature. She is still gladdened by the sight of these flowers that bring back the memory of that newborn boy, codachromed among malevolent blooms. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you. So um, our final reader before the break will be Mary Makovsky. Um, her latest books are World Enough and Time and Traction, uh, which won the Snyder Prize. She lives in Warwick, New York, um, but her son and his family have recently moved to California. Welcome, Mary. You're, you're muted. All right, I just wanted to thank Lucy and uh, Ruth. And the first poem I'm going to read is Jane Hirschfield's poem. I wanted to read it because I also had to cut down a tree at one point. Today, another universe. The arborist has determined senescence, beetles, canker, quickened by drought. But in any case, not prunable, not treatable, not to be propped. And so, the branch from which the sharp shinned hawks and their mate cries, the trunk where the ant, the red squirrel's 80 foot playground, the bark, cambium, pine sap, cluster of needles, the Japanese patterns, the ink net, the dapple on certain fish. Today, for some, a universe will vanish. First noisily, then just another silence. The silence of after, once the theater has emptied. Of bewilderment after the glacier, the species, the star. Something else in the scale of quickening things will replace it. This hole of light in the light, the puzzled birds swerving around it. And the next one is by Judith McCombs. 
it's in the desert section. Um, pictures not in our albums, Mojave Desert, 1948. Somewhere it is still a dream of safety. Our young parents hauling us up the dark paths, father blocking the wheels of the trailer, while mother lets go the emergency brake and eases the Ford into low, pulls forward and slows, pulls forward and waits. As if I had watched from a road cut, I see the small oval Ford pale in the shadows, our gray-blue trailer weighing it down, the asphalt road falling away on all sides into blackness, the curve ahead climbing to blackness. Across the vast basin of desert, the night-drowned ridges and foothills, a coyote howls and is answered. There are no lights but ours on the earth, no farther lights except the slow stars. In the back of the car, in the warm nest of children, I drift from sleep to waking, breath to breath, as the car labors and rests, labors and rests. And the night outside is a slow, swelling sea lapping the mountains, black waters so vast that a ship could founder. A thousand lit ships go down, all lights but our own go under. And I've also, I've crossed those mountains, uh, mountains like that in the Rockies and <laughs> can be quite frightening. Um, this is my poem, which is in the anthology. Um, it's from my book, World Enough and Time. Dear editor, the light tracks me all day, sitting at my desk, late afternoon now. Air holds its breath, barely a tremble in the fountain grass, the box elder leaning against the glass, a small plane droning low over the hills. Does it seem leisurely? Does all seem well? Today I composed more and more fervent letters to the editors of every local paper. Why it must change. Why we must think who we are as the same that is never the same, turned over leaves that flamed or quietly browned. What dies what thrives in the garden every year is different, unpredictable. Our share's enough. We can't change the weather, we used to say, though now we know better. Too late moves toward us faster than the fast retreating glaciers. We keep thinking we'll advance forever. Thank you. Thank you. Mary, thank you. It's good to see you again. <laughs> Greetings from Ohio. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> oh. So, um, what we'll do now oh, is we'll, we'll take a five minute break um, and then we'll come back uh, and hear Ruth read with two more contributors. So it's time to get a drink of water or a bite to eat, or uh, you can use the chat, whatever you want to do. Okay. Everybody come back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> our next reader is Ruth Nolan, my co-editor of Fire and Rain, Eco Poetry of California. Um, she's also the editor of No Place for a Puritan, the Literature of California's Deserts, and she's the author of a poetry collection called Ruby Mountain. 
Uh, her writing has appeared widely in magazines and anthologies, and she has a new poetry book called Fire Regime, uh, which will be published soon by Moonrise Press. Uh, she's currently a professor of English and creative writing at the College of the Desert in Palm Desert, California. Um, but she was formerly a wildland firefighter, as uh, she has mentioned. Oh. And she was based in the Southern California desert and mountains. So, thank you, Lucy. Um, well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad you're here and thank you for joining us today. Um, yeah, basically, um, I'm just very um, excited by our anthology. I'm really grateful to Lucy for inviting me on board to co-edit. And I just feel like we both come to see in recent, you know, months here that writing about the writing about our ecologies in California is a way for us to understand our ecologies. And I know that for the Mojave Desert, the ecologies are still not completely known. So a good friend of mine is a plant botanist um, in the Mojave Desert for the past 20 years. And he showed me a map of all the known botanic species of native plants in California. And the entire rest of the state is like all these dots on it. Like we've already gotten to all these plants, but the Mojave Desert is still like empty almost. So this is an opportunity for us to learn because how can we take care of our environment if we don't really understand it? If we don't really understand our relationships to it. So a lot of what I'm writing um, now is poetry and prose about wildfire, firefighting, why do these big fires happen? What is our relationship to them? What does our relationship to them need to be? Because fire isn't going away in California. It's an important force and um, there's just a lot to understand and know as we negotiate these increasingly huge wildfires. The first poem I'm going to read is by the epic um, and late Ursula K. Le Guin who very um, wonderfully had contributed poetry for our book before she passed away. A song used when damming a creek or diverting water to a holding tank or irrigation. To the weasel, to the water weasel, may it go, may it go. Tarweed, the corn roots, need this water also. Buckbrush, the bean leaves, need this water also. Way of the water's going, we do not wish this. Let it go to the water weasel, to the water skater. Let the wild goose's wings carry it upward. Let the dragonfly larva carry it downward. We do not wish this, we do not desire it. Only the water we borrow on our way to returning. We who are doing this all will be dying. Way of the water's going. Bear with us in this place now, on your way to returning. And as most of you know, um, the title of the book, Fire and Rain, um, water is another really big issue in California. We don't have the rivers and greenery and the rain and the snow. The people in the greener parts of our country do, or world even. So the battles and fights over who gets the water, where is it going to go, you know, where are we taking water from and transporting it elsewhere, depleting ancient aquifers? There are many issues going on in California right now and critically in the Mojave and Southern California deserts, just to let you know. So um, I'm glad that we're able to embrace the rain, the water in our anthology because these are critical supplies and it's very political and very displacing for many. The next poem I'm reading um, along that topic is by Stephen Meadows. The poem is called Drought. Hot breath on lupin, on sizzling sierra parched grass. The seed pods ticked tocked in slow wind on the skittle this summer. Madrones are bright yellow, ponderosa, brown needles, low water sucks the stone. So my next poem, um, the one I'm going to read, I'm going to read two of my own poems. And this one is from the anthology and it's called Mopping Up. Does anyone have an idea what mopping up means besides 
being in the kitchen. Mopping up is one of the jobs that firefighters do on wildland fires. So instead of a mop, you actually have a shovel and other fire tools. And after a fire burns through an area, sometimes it takes weeks for firefighters to go through on these mega huge fires. The fire's kind of basically out, but somebody needs to get in there and make sure there's no smoldering hot spots. So we basically literally have to walk through this stuff, stirring the ashes, cooling off the hot spots. You know, it's really tedious work. So um, I've been kind of stricken lately with how many domestic terms are used in the firefighting world. Um, so I'm, I'm writing a lot playing on those concepts. So mopping up is one of those. Mopping up. It's the most unraveled and well-paying job I've had. Fighting fires in far-flung, fiery wilderness areas, all the way from the San Bernardino National Forest in the south to the Panamint Mountains near Death Valley, the Southern Sierra, Yosemite, the San Gabriel's looming above LA. Most of the time, I was the only girl on the crew, the only woman cutting fire line and sucking down smoke. And after a fire had laid down across ravaged meadows and once forested slopes, our job was far from done. We hiked in baked potato hot, ankle deep ash that blew eerily in the wind like shed snakeskins as we finished off dying wildfires by stirring and cooling the molten detritus with our sharp shovels to finish the job we sprayed dribbles of water from the fat bags that sloshed like heavy vertigo on our backs, also known as piss pumps. We struggled to keep pace in the slowed down underbelly of burned up things in our cherished, if little known, Golden State geographies with lonely names. Rattlesnake Mountain, Horse Thief Spring, Last Chance Range, Toro Peak. Above us, the whispered remains of familiar forest trees lurking black and tall and jagged, also known as widow makers. Stripped of the dignity of their given names, Jeffrey Pine, Ponderosa, Western Sequoia, California Black Oak. At our feet, the complete bequeathing of the latter fuels. Manzanita, Western Juniper, Coyote Brush, Poison Oak. We could never be sure a fire was completely out. So we kept stirring and stirring ash, sifting through what had been scorched, watching each unearthed ember spark hot and red, then wish into its puffy last breath. So this is what I remember most from my firefighting days, the mopping up, making sure the fire was put to bed, soothing the feverish brow or forsaken landscapes to cool them down. That and how often the guys on the crew would ask me why I'd left behind the apron of my domesticity to flirt with flames instead of them. So you can only imagine what it's like to be out there. Those guys love in there. And I'm going to read one more poem. Um, this is a poem that I've written recently. And um, so to keep along with the um, echo poetry, wildfire, relationships, awareness, understanding. Can you guys all hear me? Because I'm getting an unstable internet connection here. Um, this poem speaks to that. And I apologize, but I have to read it from my iPhone because I'm having printer issues. This poem is called Teaching My Fire to, I'm sorry, Teaching My Daughter to Put Out Fire. It isn't your typical scenario, a young mother who worked seven seasons ago as a wildland firefighter, driving her Jeep in four wheel drive up California 3 and 14, the back dirt road to Big Bear from the desert with her daughter, who is five years old, to reach the rattlesnake fire burn zone the last fire she ever fought. This is another hot July day. The mother wants to see for herself how the mangled landscape looks today. What remains of the Joshua and Pinion trees? 
What bird sounds filter now through the barren air? What reference points to negotiate by without the Jeffrey pines or live oak, without the juniper? And she worked on this fire. She watched it all burn away. Huge boulder scatter revealed ominous ghost whales rising from the heavy smoke. She wants to reassess, look for supply. She's been well, one careless family, a father locked away in prison, his best friend dead. Some things have been destroyed forever in our ecology. Some things have been saved. Some things new and strange grow in this space. Will there be birds, ravens, or a few Western jay? Will there be mountain wildfires suckling the darkened dirt? Perhaps a few deer negotiating their way across a moonscape on their way to a small spring, jackrabbits hopping in and out of the slowly dying Joshua trees. Before they reach the lonely place, they stop at an empty campground so the daughter can run and play. And the daughter spots it first, a wisp of smoke tickled by the light wind and rising a careless camper, a campfire not put out. The mother reaches for her army shovel and hands her daughter a waddle, bottle of water. We have work to do. This is how you put out a fire before it has a chance to erupt. Look for the small things, a wisp of sexy smoke, a gleam of orange eyes, a seduction of tiny flame. This is where it starts. This is where it stops. Nothing more will burn here today. So, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I have now, since I've done all this firefighting, I can't go anywhere in all of my California journeys without thinking about fire and how flammable things are. And like I drive people crazy, but I think now people are starting to actually appreciate it. <laughs> oh, it's a bad fire day. Okay. So um, our next reader, I'd like to introduce our next reader, Heidi Sheridan. And where's Heidi? Heidi, hi. Okay, I'm glad you're with us today. Thank you for your beautiful work in our anthology. Heidi Sheridan's latest work reflects the impact that technology has had on our interaction with animals. She currently teaches poetry, writes poetry, and paints poetry in New Jersey. So welcome today, Heidi. Thank you so much. Thank you for and being thank you to all of um, my friends who are here and also a work colleague. Okay. Um, the first poem I'll read, I wrote about my childhood friend Scooter. This is one of the poems in the anthology and you'll know what section it's in. Desert snow. My neighbor and I were eight when snow covered the high desert making white dunes in the field of cactus, tumbleweeds, only yuccas pierced through, last night's coyote howl, now a calling, something happened. It was easy to play the hours, run over what usually pricked, a hundred spikes in the left calf, mother tweezing transparent yellow splinters, a sidewinder come round a Joshua tree, a scorpion ready for an ankle. We reached into the unknown for snowpacks, unscathed, faces blushed with joy, our mittens white with wet. Um, the second poem I'll read is from another contributor to the anthology. Um, and I chose it because it's very interesting to me to hear how the desert is perceived by first time visitors. It's called Holy Saturday in the Desert by Stephanie Schultz. After three hours of Los Angeles traffic, everyone in a hurry to get to the middle of nowhere, a rest stop is calling me in from the heat. Sunbeams in a cloudless sky beat like a bass drum on my Midwestern skin. Each stomp, each kick, each new melody vibrates through my bones. Joshua Tree is a real desert town like none I've seen before, shadowed by a national park with a visitor center on the edge of a street corner between Joshua Trees that grow only here. 
I bet there are locals who can't name the two deserts that meet in this very spot, but I brushed up on my geography and history as if I might fit in. I long to know this place, to experience the highs and lows, to live like a nomad in some place warm, possessing only nature. Most who come here barely see the land. It's the day before Easter, hot and tanned, trashy folks in cut off Coors t-shirts hold open for me the broken automatic sliding door. The AC inside the gas station is a welcome comfort after the topless Jeep ride here, a sweat I couldn't overcome. It's a stark contrast, an unknown forecast of my desert night ahead. I grew up about 10 minutes from um, Joshua Tree. So um, I didn't know that Heidi. That's I grew up in Apple Valley, which is just right down the road. I have a friend who lives there. Yeah. Um, awesome. My mom still lives in Yucca Valley. So, yeah. Okay. So the next few poems I wrote in California during um, the drought that started around 2011, and some say it ended in 2017, some people say 2019. I'm more apt to think of the, the 19 date because every time I go visit, it is dry as bone. Um, the poem is called Spring Morning. Bird song the first sound to leave us as we age, but the only hope song. Finches, finches, and morning doves, come to me, here, I'll save you. Coo, coo, repeat. My mother's hands are curling, my three sisters' skin is burning, off with acid, my grandparents' ashes. Only one year left of water in California. I can't refill aquifers, they settle. Elsewhere, the rains flood, please. Come to me, here you will be saved. Is it that simple, a little blessed water, and I'm forgiven? What have I done? I will sing to the rain gods as it rains. I will forgive myself and you and him and him, him, hum, hang me, earth. Water for the birds. Mom lets the hose drip for the quail and leaves old lettuce for jackrabbits, consults her bird book most mornings, Orioles are her favorite come spring. Yesterday, a sharp shinned hawk drank from the plate 110 in the desert. Do birds feel exhaustion like us? Mental strain after taking care of their elders? Mom drags the hose around the yard, cane in the other hand, watering oleanders, mimosas, olive trees with no olives. Most of the cypress are dying, diseased. Centipedes, red ants, orange beetles, white spiders, all head toward water. Keep watering, keep walking, keep moving until the sun finally wins. Um, this is my other poem from the anthology. It's about the resilience of nature. Sequoia National Park, California. The tops of the sequoia hide in the mist, so I look at one's fire scar, that hollowed center. How do they grow when so weakened for centuries? Do they have bad days? I want to change my life before another snowstorm hits the Sierra Nevada. River hike a fork of the Kern River or sleep in the mountains surrounding me. I want to do it with someone else. But now it is Tuesday and I'm back from the park. What of hibiscus and fuchsia? Will the hydrangeas and the new myrtle make it past September? Of my many fruit trees, one orange grew in New Jersey, four limes, many lemons, all taken into the sunroom now. And then it's all moss and shadows again. Time, explosions, Logging leaves stumps bigger than cars or pools. Now I understand the power of passivity. 
Last week, a sequoia fell across a major access trail. No one knew what to do. Build a bridge, cut a hole, go around. The sequoia's bark even resists fire. How do we start if we begin with fear? So much taller than me, soft yet splintery. If you pull bark off, you can see its blood sap. I think I might have one, one more minute. Do I have one more minute, Lucy? Oh, um, that's I... fine, sure. Okay. All right, so this final poem is uh, part of a found poem series. Um, if you want to, every day you can read an article about the suffering of um, animals at human hands. Mm -hmm. Buffaloes in New York. Last night, a herd of bison escaped, swam the river, then got shot. Earlier, and in California, two men left out their trash, then used rifles on two baby bears and their mother trying to eat. Everything is dying, but do we have to speed it up? I stand on a bus through a tunnel. Know this river leads to scaffolds and pigeons and pollution. I might eat a whole fish tonight. I want a different life with the baby llamas and my friends to help me milk the cow. Mm. Yeah, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Heidi. Um, wonderful evocation of so many desert places that, you know, and I'm really excited that all these, we have so many desert poems in this anthology. Um, in counterpart to our cooler and greener parts of the state and our more vertical parts of the state as well. Um, thank you for joining us. And then we have um, our final letter, Jason Todd, and there's JC. You're muted. Uh, I'm unmuted. I'm not muted. JC, there you are. Hello, and I'm um, so glad you're with us today. Um, so welcome J.C. Todd, whose recent work concerns the traumatic effects of war on women. Beyond Repair is forthcoming from Able News Press in 2021, and the Damages of Mourning, an Eric Hoffer Award finalist, congratulations, was published by Moonstone Press in 2018. Thanks for joining us today. Are you ready to read? Yes, I, your voice trailed off. I wasn't sure. Oh, was I cutting off? Okay, yeah. It's okay. Welcome, I'm glad you're here today. Thank you, I'm really glad to be here. And I can't tell you how moved I am hearing these poems, which I've read, but to hear them being given voice, some of us reading our own, but then also reading the poems of others. It's this kind of collective action that we need. I don't know if it'll fix things, but it could move things on. So I'm going to begin uh, with a poem by Anne Fisher Worth. Her most recent book is The Bones of Winter Birds, and it's out from Terrapin Press. This is in the, um, the Sierra Nevada and Cascades section on page 303, if you want to follow along. Light, Olympic Valley. California, in memory of Zenic Seraldi. You bring your grief to the mountain, lay it down. The shaggy mule's ears dance in this clear light, and the shadow of each long leaf joins in the dancing. Blue lupine, speckled Elisa, Sending off sugar and heat, the poppies furling gold. What do they know of desolation? How could the ragged daisies stop plunging in the wind? Or dust and day relinquish their bright unfolding? The pine mat, manzanita, low mariposa lily, a junglos click and trill. Or that skinny brown horse in the stable yard, one ear cocked, softly whickering, shifting his haunches, and all the light you will ever need. Uh, 
I'll read three of my own now, uh, two that are not in the anthology, and one of them just recently written. Um, I've only been in California twice, but um, I think most profoundly was when I drove alone from San Francisco, I had a van uh, to, uh, well, back home, East. Um, and I went through the Mojave Desert on Old Route 66, a portion of it. And that, even though I only got out once to walk a little because I knew I was a foreigner there and didn't know what to do if I got in trouble, um, it really it permeated me. This is called Mojave Dawn Song. Private is different than secret, whose words go under, swallowed. The moon sets in their chill, too heavy for sky. No lark song here, but it's morning. Come, let's break our fast or starve together. Slide out from lives too clotted for breath. Why choose silence? when speech is the only moisture in this drought. And I'll continue with the poem from What Space This Body. Um, the Tunnel at Point Lobos. I wanted to go there because I'd read that it was uh, munitions were stored there during the Second World War. But when I got there, what imp impressed me, just like pressed through me, was the surf, the tunnel at Point Lobos. Stop your whistle, your scuffle and cough. You've gone down the throat of howl. If you resist with human noise, bad nerves, you will be spit a dingy rag, a Jonah, into blaring light. Listen, you don't have to tune your ear or turn your head to hear it. The aqueous membrane of wide open eyes, useless, you think, in the black sluice of this tunnel. It's tympanic. It will vibrate with sound. Reedy, gut string of the wind, unvarying timber, timber of snarled earth below, icy quavering, like whole notes shattered of spray on rocks, soften into dark. What's endless, listen, it rises in you, a grace note, a glimmer. And the last poem I'll read is Foraging, and it's in the Hills and Canyons section. The notes for it were taken. I often write on foot, plein air writing, you know, little note cards stuffed in my pocket. And uh, the notes uh, for this poem were taken uh, on Mount Tam during a wasn't really a hike, but it was sort of a trudge up and a leisurely stroll about, foraging. What was there we could not name. It was too whole to be honed. Saying tall, omitted moss. Saying trail, refused the intertwining canopy. Then one of us broke a leaf at its central vein. Remarkable, the redolent oil of laurel in air, on skin. For a moment it was all there was. Then there was us, breathing its particular aroma. The atmosphere sorted into scents. We had names for redwood, jack pine, damsons sweating in a pack. And the scorched sugar we discovered was a hilltop of rye, trampled by deer. Wandering a maze laid out by their hooves, 
we merged, we entered the under, I'm going to start that sentence again. Wandering a maze laid out by hooves, we entered the underfoot of field, brushed against tassels, tamped seed into turf. In the haze, we were stag, vole, weasel at work. Lying under muslin now, home, in bed at early light, we don't remember what led us to the headlands, but the hunger lingers in the pungency of leaves crumbled among keys and coins on the dresser tray. Scent turns us away from insubstantial memory. One skin is all we want. Beyond the ridge of your shoulder, the window, wide open. Beyond its screen, the filmy half-shut eye of the waning moon. If we looked back at ourselves from a great distance, say how far the moon has traveled from itself when it was Earth. We could not tell our tracks from the herds, the headlands from the great cascades, the land from water. Thank you. Thank you. And that, that was a terrific reading. And I, I thought everybody's reading was really terrific. It's, yes, absolutely. It's really been exciting. Yay, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for being here and sharing your beautiful work. It's very uplifting and connective. Definitely. All of us across our ge geographies and eco ecologies.